Sudsy Amber stuff, right? Yeah, yeah I've been hearing good things about it. <laughs> this Marketplace podcast is supported by Mosey Cloud Backup. Protect your critical files with maximum security from Mosey Cloud Backup and securely access them anywhere, including your smartphone or tablet. Visit mozy.com to learn more. A look at Apple customers and national security. Don't miss the numbers, the news, and Kai's final note. Subscribe to the Marketplace Podcast. Find it on iTunes or online at marketplace.org slash podcasts. From APM in New York, I'm David Brancaccio with the global perspective on business and economics. Apple Computer is trying to give customers a sense of how often the government officially demands private data. The first six months of this year, there were 3,500 U.S. requests, and that's just been disclosed by the company. Many of those appear related to stolen phones, and it's not just the U.S. government asking Apple for this stuff and fellow companies. The BBC's Dave Lee has been looking into this. Dave, what kinds of requests is Apple saying it's been honoring? The source of requests they've been getting are mainly about lost and stolen devices uh, and also to aid in finding missing people, missing children and so on. They've broken it down by country and the largest number of requests has come from the US but there's been between 2,000 and 3,000 of those. The next biggest uh, number of requests comes from the UK and that's a considerably smaller number, 141 requests, Apple say. And it's all part of rebuilding trust because in a way that was the tech company's biggest failing here. Not that it was going on but that they were kind of in cahoots if you like, with the government in not making this public. So many companies have kind of banded together and said, OK, look, we need to tell our users precisely what is being asked for and why. The BBC's Dave Lee in London. Apple's among the technology companies that are pressuring the government to allow them to be clearer about the extent of so-called national security requests. Later today, CBS will release its profits report. The broadcaster made headlines in August when it went head-to-head with Time Warner Cable. The standoff may have cost Time Warner more than 300,000 subscribers, but CBS seems to have done better, at least for now. Marketplace's Jeff Tyler reports. TV companies like CBS used to make most of their money from advertising. Now they're getting a lot of their revenues from license fees charged to cable companies. That's what the standoff with Time Warner was about, how Vogel follows the industry for Vogel Capital Management. CBS especially has been a leader in developing this license fee, and it can add up to hundreds of millions of dollars. Other TV networks see those millions and want in on the action. But too much of a good thing could backfire for broadcasters. Investors shouldn't necessarily assume that these revenue streams are going to continue forever. That's David McAdams, an economics professor at Duke University. When networks charge cable companies higher fees, those costs get passed along to consumers. When fees get too high, McAdams says consumers will disconnect their cable and access shows on the computer or with rabbit ear antennas. That scenario wouldn't be too profitable for cable companies or CBS. I'm Jeff Tyler for Marketplace. Now let's do the numbers. 
On this day after Election Day in many parts of the country, stock index futures in the U.S. are up sharply. The FT100 in London is up a tenth percent. The Nikkei in Japan closed up two tenths percent, while the key index in Hong Kong closed flat. Show Marketplace how much you like us. Stay connected to our hosts, reporters, and top stories on Facebook. Find us at facebook.com slash APM Marketplace. There's a campaign ramping up in Washington to block big companies from taking a tax deduction when they settle cases with the government. The spark for this is the pile of settlements now worked out or still under negotiation involving the biggest of banks, J.P. Morgan Chase. In the case of alleged abuses of mortgage bonds, J.P. Morgan has agreed to pay $5.1 billion settlement, all of which seems to be tax deductible. That could save the bank an estimated $1.5 billion in taxes. Now, the U.S. Public Interest Research Group has a petition drive to stop deductions like these, and two Democrats in the House have proposed a law. But Alan Sloan, senior editor-at-large at Fortune magazine, is having none of this. He says in the Fannie and Freddie case, there's a big difference between a settlement, tax deductible, and a fine, which is something else. Good morning, Mr. Sloan. Good morning, David. So among the many discussions that J.B. Morgan is having, there is one settlement that is set in stone. This is the $5 billion-plus settlement involving Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? That's right. All right. So they get to deduct the settlement from their taxes? There was a business dispute between Fannie and Freddie and JP. JP settled the business dispute for $5.1 billion. It is the classic definition of a business expense. But wait, Alan, people who are critical of this, who are quite upset with this, are saying, I thought this was a, a punishment for for them doing something. Why do they get to deduct a punishment? Because it's not a punishment. Fannie and Freddie say, you guys owe us money. JP finally agrees to make it go away. Here, Here's $5.1 billion. Don't darken my doorstep anymore. It's a business expense. Now, if it were not a settlement but was a a fine, and that could happen to J.P. Morgan in some of these other cases, a fine, is that deductible from taxes? A fine is not deductible from taxes. And and by the way, since we're talking about this, would you like to know where the $5 million is going to end up? Where does it go then? It's going to end up in the treasury. It's going to taxpayers because of the way Fannie and Freddie work. Every extra $5 billion that wanders in the door wanders out the door fairly soon to the Treasury. So we taxpayers are getting all $5 billion. J.P. Morgan is getting to deduct $5 billion, but it's still out of pocket, 65% of $5 billion. And it's a lot worse off than it was. And we taxpayers are better off than we were. Alan Sloan, Senior Editor at Large, Fortune Magazine. Thank you very much. My pleasure, David. And Starbucks of coffee fame said this morning it wants to hire 10,000 military veterans or the spouses of those on active duty. Five years is the time frame. Starbucks plans to bring in specialized recruiters. Former Defense Secretary Robert Gates is on the Starbucks board and says veterans and spouses are a demographic that is, quote, one of the most underutilized talent pools in the country. For a sense of scale, 10,000 jobs would represent more than 7 percent of Starbucks' current U.S. workforce. In New York, I'm David Brancaccio with the Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media. We don't have a man with her qualifications. That was Alice. She wanted me to come over and make some fudge with her. Voters head for the middle ground. Compromise and reaching across the aisle. Prayers before public meetings. This is a particularly murky area of constitutional law. Suspended NFLer told to toughen up teammate. It's going to put more pressure on the Dolphins coaching staff. Good morning. I'm Steve Kathan with the CBS World News Roundup. A hard-fought battle in Virginia, a blowout win in New Jersey, a split decision in the races for governor on Election Day. Democrat Terry McAuliffe edged Tea Party Republican Ken Cuccinelli in Virginia in what some said was a referendum on Obamacare. At a time when Washington was often broken, 
Just think about what Virginia has been able to accomplish when we work together. In New Jersey, Republican Chris Christie easily won a second term. I know that if we can do this in Trenton, New Jersey, maybe the folks in Washington, D.C. should tune in their TVs right now. See how it's done. CBS News election analyst Anthony Salvato says Christie was able to find the middle ground in a blue state. A lot of Democrats, a third, crossed over to vote for him. He won the majority of moderates. He won a quarter of liberals. That's a real bipartisan endorsement of his candidacy. CBS News political director John Dickerson is with us. John, Chris Christie is looking more and more like a presidential candidate, and that Virginia battle was a test of Tea Party strength. What did we learn from all this? Well, certainly, Chris Christie, when he um, spoke at his victory speech, it sounded like an announcement speech for his next campaign. He was able to say, here's what I was able to do in New Jersey. And the message was I was able to get the job done, even though it's a Democratic state. In Virginia, the Tea Party did kind of come back at the end. The polls showed the Democrat uh, McAuliffe up by uh, double digits in one case a couple of weeks out. In in the end, they made the push. Republicans did uh, about the president's health care plan. That may have been in what caused that gap to close. But does Virginia really tell us anything about Obamacare in a, in a larger sense? I don't think it does. It certainly gives Republicans, I think, something to run against. Uh, and they were going to do this anyway, Democrats up for re-election in 2014. But we are in a special moment for Obamacare, which is the, the disastrous rollout. The question is whether that moment will continue and elongate a year from now when those elections are happening or whether the site will get fixed, the program will kick in and won't be as uh, a potent as it may have been in Virginia. In New York City, Liberal Democrat Bill de Blasio was a runaway winner for mayor. The people of this city have chosen a progressive path. Voters in financially strapped Detroit elected former medical center director Mike Duggan. He's the first white mayor of that city in four decades. Boston chose Democrat Martin Walsh. You've made Boston a place where dreams come through. CBS's Heather Bosch is with us now. She's been looking at ballot measures around the country. Heather? Colorado voters decided to tax recreational pot, but they said no to raising a billion dollars a year for education by boosting Colorado's income tax. Voters in SeaTac, Washington, are passing a $15 minimum wage for airport and hotel workers. Everybody deserves a living wage. That's what I'm happy about. We've got it. People in Washington state are rejecting mandatory labels on genetically altered food. Supporters are disappointed Houston doesn't want to turn the Astrodome into a convention center. This is shocking. There is no alternative plan. It will likely be torn down. New York voters are betting big on gambling as an economic boost. They've approved seven new casinos. When local politicians meet with the public, should it all begin with, let us pray? CBS's Barry Bagnato says it's a question today for the U.S. Supreme Court. For years, prayers have opened town board meetings in Greece, New York, near Rochester. May the Lord be with you. Except on rare occasions, they've had one thing in common. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The very heart of our Christian faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. The six Catholic and three Jewish justices must decide whether this is an unconstitutional endorsement of religion generally and of one religion particularly. Barry Lynn of Americans United for separation of church and state. People are being prayed to, prayed at by ministers standing behind a podium with the town of Greece seal on it. Alliance defending freedom lawyer Brett Harvey urges the court not to upset a time-honored tradition. Even the founders knew that there was benefit to doing it and that it was not an established of religion. This is a particularly murky area of constitutional law. Clear rules are needed, says CBS News senior legal analyst Andrew Cohen. The justices have struggled to come up with a standard, which is why we see so many of these cases. Barry Bagnato, CBS News, Washington. Health Secretary Kathleen Sebelius goes back to Capitol Hill today to face more questions about the Obamacare rollout. CBS's Peter Mayer joins us live. He's at the White House. And on this first anniversary of his re-election, President Obama is still fighting for his top domestic accomplishment. He'll make the case in Dallas today as the White House is still explaining and defending this now famous promise. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. With this now added qualifier. What we said was you could keep it if it hasn't changed since the laws passed. The administration plans to release the first Obamacare enrollment numbers next week, and officials still promise the troubled website will be fixed by the end of this month. The 15th state is poised to legalize same-sex marriage, Illinois. This bill, having received a constitutional majority, is hereby declared passed. Democrat State Representative Greg Harris has long sponsored gay marriage legislation. Ladies and gentlemen, what same-sex couples in Illinois want for their families 
is just what you want for your family. Republican Dwight Kaye says amendments to benefit religious institutions are not enough. You can't dress it up 